continues to be normal. All right, the chamber pressure looks good. Tall enough. Water towers can fly! Yes! Ego down phenomenal. Water down by SCE doll. Bring in SCE doll. Yikes. You bet. Okay. We don't need any more of these. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of NASA Spaceflight Live. Let me know if you can hear me in chat. I'm sure the 5x5s will be rolling in already. Um, there we go. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's show where we will be answering your questions and giving you some updates on Starship and just basically talking space for an hour and a half because that's what we like to do. My name is Thomas Burkhart. I'm the news director here at NASA Space Flight, and I'm joined by two of my good friends here. First of all, Nick out there is in the field at Starbase Texas. Nick, how are you doing? Hey, I am doing really good, Thomas. Uh, thanks for asking. It's a little little toasty out here, but that's that's how it tends to be in July. So, yay. Thank you, Nick. And also out there, or not out there in the field, but also back in a studio with me is none other than Chris Bergen, NASA Spaceflight Managing Editor. Chris, how are you doing today? Uh, greetings, Thomas and everybody. Uh, it is very toasty here too, but Nick would absolutely frown at me if I mentioned it was 80 degrees toasty because 80 well, degrees at Starbase is quite nice. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Is this Celsius or Fahrenheit? I feel like we need to specify. Uh, Fahrenheit. In, it's, uh, uh, freedom, freedom units is 80. If it was 80 degrees 80. Celsius, we'd have much bigger problems. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but thank you, Chris and Nick, for joining. Also, Michael Baylor working in the background, as always. Michael, thank you for helping the show be what it is. And uh, everyone in chat, thank you for tuning in. We'll be taking your questions, providing some updates as to what we're looking at here in Texas. As you can see, we're looking at Booster 7 out there on the pad um, with some chopsticks at the very bottom of the booster since like yesterday, which is weird. Um, but uh, Ship 24 is out and about there too. I can't see it in this view, but I know it's out there somewhere. There it is. Um, so the two vehicles that will make that first orbital test flight out there getting ready for their kind of final pre-launch test campaigns, which of course we are very closely watching. There you go. There's the camera view. Uh, thank you, Nick, for rolling out there and joining comms as well. So let's dive right in. What are we looking at? What are we looking for for this week? We see crews working, it looks like maybe on the heat shield for ship 24 right now. We've seen the chopsticks moving around booster seven, which has done some proof testing and things like that. Nick, what are you looking to see happen in the next couple of days down in Starbase? Well, first of all, I'm looking for a uh, Tory Bruno to show up with his cowboy hat and maybe a couple horses. Um, <laughs> but if that if that doesn't happen, which you know will disappoint myself and Chris a little bit, uh, hopefully some static fires. We'll see. Um, I feel like we've been waiting for the booster static fire for a good couple of weeks now, but uh, every day it seems to be closer than the day before, so that's always a good sign. But uh, yeah, possibly static fires would be my guess. Static fires is going to be the big ticket. We've seen, if, to, for those who may be um, more new to the Starship scene, if you're just kind of tuning in recently, a boot, the farthest a booster has gotten in testing is the Booster 3 vehicle completed a three-engine static fire. And it only had three engines installed, and it completed a static fire with those three engines. But we've never seen anything beyond that. We've never seen engine testing with a booster that had more than three engines. And, of course, Booster 7 has all 33 engines installed. So getting those static fires up to higher numbers of engines is going to be really cool. Um, we have seen on the ship side, we've pretty much seen the same kind of testing we expect from Ship 24. Ship 20 completed all the way up to a six engine static fire, including the three vacuum engines at sea level. So we would expect Ship 24 to probably conduct a sort of similar test campaign, Chris, or were we expecting anything different from the Ship 20 campaign? I think they may have learned from the previous campaigns and may have modified what they do to get ship qualified, ready for what will be their full stack. But I find it all intriguing because we have currently the two vehicles tasked with the orbital test flight out in the launch site. We've also got Booster 8 now being stacked and we've got Ship 25. So there's a potential that by the time Ship 24 and Booster 7 have been stacked. They'll be ready to roll out the next vehicles as well. And that'd be very Starbase-like. Remember, they had two test flight vehicles out at the same time during the initial test cycle. So it's not beyond the capability that we may see a, a release of tension, shall we say, from Starbase, where we've been waiting so long for the, for the obviously, the documentation to pass. They'll have to wait again for the launch license, and I'm sure they're working on that as we speak. 
the static fire test campaign will come between the two. So this is what the next phase is now. Both vehicles are out there, they're both ready technically for what will be a static fire campaign. I think the question we need to be asking is what will fire first, booster or ship? What do we think? Ooh. Well, I hope I hope the booster. Uh, but yeah. it, the ship does seem to be clicking along as well, so I think it'll be close, if anything. Keep in mind that there's not just a static fire test, though. We're also looking for something along the lines of a spin prime test or a pre-burner yeah. test, which, Chris, I don't know if you want to plug your Nightbot commands here. <laughs> I do. What those are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's put these into the chat room. So, yeah, when people go, what do you mean by spin prime, Chris? And what on earth do you mean by pre-burner? There you go. Just type the command SP and PB into the chat room and Nightbot will be along hastily with an explanation. There you go. So we are looking for those kind of tests that would probably pre uh, come before a uh, actual full thrust static firing testing. But um, that testing we would hope to see maybe as soon as this week. And the thing to look out for will, of course, be everyone's favorite question these days, has Mary received an overpressure notice? Um, <laughs> so an overpressure notice would give us an indication that the testing is not only involves loading propellant, but an ignition source, which basically means a pre-burner test would likely require that. Um, and so that's what we're looking for. And that'll give us a heads up when they're getting to that stage of testing. Um, obviously we'll have the 24 seven feeds like your kind of the camera views you're seeing now are also available on Starbase live, which is live 24 seven. Um, but when we get into those engine tests where we're going to see some fire out of the engines, you can be sure that we're going to spool up some dedicated commentated coverage because those are the big ticket tests. Um, but that's what we're kind of looking for this week. And with that recap, we have just enough time to have gotten some questions into the queue. You see how that works. Um, so we're going to dive into some questions here. And uh, first of all, I also want to thank everyone who sends the support our way. Uh, Dougal started out the stream with gifting five new Red Team memberships. Thank you so much, Dougal, for that. And also thank you to um, Dougal for providing the memberships and everyone who joins the membership program. Thank you so much. Um, this is an interesting question from Musical. I'm going to have to look this up. Ms. Gawolos, thanks for the support. It says a few more days to one year since the boot first booster static fire. What wow. is the anniversary wow. of the booster three static fire? Hold on. I think Super... it was what's it, late July, I guess, huh? Was that booster three? First booster ever three, Super yeah. Heavy Static Fire, July 19th, according to some site wow. named NASASpaceFlight.com. <laughs> uh, so that's what it looks like. Oh, yeah, that was the live show. So July 19th. Nine more days. Wow. wow. All right, so what happens first? The anniversary or does Booster 7 fire up first? You know what? Knowing the way Elon works, the way his mind works, he'll be like, we need to make sure no one starts tweeting one year anniversary since the last static fire of a booster at Starbase. Right. Please fire it up. Just do anything. Do a Spring Prime, something, anything. <laughs> yeah. So we will look at that. Uh, but there you go. Thank you, Ms. Ghouls. Also uh, saying, can you confirm that the two white dots on the booster's engine bay are the full send and confuse media buttons? <laughs> uh, Ms. Ghouls, thank you so much. I My personal actual speculation, and to be very clear, this is complete speculation. I'll open it up to Nick and Chris. But that photo that SpaceX tweeted that showed those two white dots in the engine bay, my guess is those are burst disks for if the tank is overpressurizing. Right. At some pressure, they'll burst to preserve the vehicle. That's my guess of what they are. I don't know if Chris and Nick had differing opinions uh, i don't but um i will go along with that myself as well or some yeah. kind of event maybe where we've seen because what rem what played on my mind was replaying the starship test flights to 15 kilometers 12.5 kilometers there's a lot of venting that comes from the after the vehicle during the ascent especially when they shut down an engine so it could be some kind of like projected vent area i don't know I think burst disc makes more sense because it looks enclosed. It looks like it is something that would be then released rather than something that's a vent that's already opened. So, yeah, I'm going to go with you, Thomas. But it was fun seeing the <laughs> suggestions come into chat during when that was released where people were coming up with all sorts of things and um, mainly food related. We won't go into that too much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Michael, for pointing them out here. This is the photo that SpaceX tweeted. And uh, even without that, can we just appreciate how cool it looks with all the engines installed? Very, yeah. very cool. Uh, but anyway, there you go. Uh, diving into some more questions here. And also, 
well, well, I expect a lot of these questions will be about Starship things, and we're certainly going to focus on Starship as that is the main topic of the episode. If you've got questions about other space things that are happening, obviously we always like to recap the full week in space news. Starship is bringing a lot of attention this week, which is why we're focusing it. But if you have other questions, I'll also look for those, and I will also ask those. And the very first question... Well, a SpaceX question is not Starship related, but I'm going to ask it anyway. James Martin says, The last Falcon 9 booster landing seemed to have more lateral distance to make at the end, and there was no landing footage. Mm. How long until it makes port till we can see if it's okay? First of all, yes, the video cut out. Yes, it's been a while since that happened. But I don't think there's been any actual indications that the booster was anything off nominal. Um, the we And by we, I mean mostly Gavin. So shout out to Space Offshore on Twitter. Um does do a very good job of tracking the recovery fleet when they're out and about um, on mission. And nothing about the return has been delayed or different from normal, which is a good indication that everything's going fine. Um, we would expect that to come back probably tomorrow afternoon, roughly. Um, it does depend on weather and how fast or slow they happen to be going on this particular trip. But as soon as maybe tomorrow at some point, we should have see that booster come back into port and uh, Thanks to our good buddy Fleet Cam, we'll be able to make sure that everything's all good. But we're not expecting anything too out of the ordinary, I don't think. And a There's quick Fleet shout Cam. out a quick shout out to Gavin. I sent an urgent communication to him asking him when he had the estimation of coming back. And as you said, it's due back Monday afternoon Eastern time. There you go. Perfect. Um, but there is a live view of Port Canaveral. You can see Bob and Doug out there, um, and they recently brought back a fairing half yes, from what? the recent mission. Mm -hmm. I think Gavin said that it's been over a year since the last time SpaceX failed to recover a fairing half, but one of the halves did not come back from this most recent mission, which is interesting. Obviously, that's going to happen every once in a while. One lost fairing is probably not the end of the world, but something worth noting at least. Um, but yeah, there you go. And of course, Fleet Cam, also live 24-7 here on the YouTube channel whenever you want to check in with the recovery operations down in Florida. Let's keep the questions coming here. Uh, here's a good question for... All right, here comes our first shuttle reference of the stream, hey. so we can check this off. Um, Deepod Dolphin says, Do you like the reminiscence of S24 placement on Ship 24? kind of looks like the orbiter names on the shuttle. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'm a big yes. fan, too, and I also made that same observation. It's like, it is I'm, in the kind of the same spot. I'm going to put a tweet from Nick, which he, he did two hours ago, into chat. It shows one of the best photographs I've seen of the logo, the six hexagonals, whatever they are, the tiles placement. I don't think they're actual tiles. I think they're just basically representing the six engines on Starship and the S24 markings. It is in the same position you'd expect a name for a vehicle to be put. So I, I think that's a wonderful addition that just makes it, I don't know, it, for me, it just makes it, maybe it's just Nick's great photography skills, but that's a wonderful photograph. It's in I think now. it adds a bit of, not officialness, maybe, but mm. something it's something different from Ship 20, where Ship 20 was really the raw metal bare, like it was built to be functional, but there was no nothing that closed it out as a flight ready vehicle. But when you put decals on something or you paint a vehicle in any way, I feel like that gives it the final go like, yes, this is a fully assembled vehicle. It is ready to be flown. And I think that's kind of the the vibe I got from them putting those decals on it. And I like that. I think we'll get real shuttle vibes when they start naming them people names or names after historic true. vehicles. I think there's still the plan is to call the first one with crew Heart of Gold, I do believe, at least unless Elon's changed the plans on that. But that's what he was going with for the first one, call it the Heart of Gold. So if it yeah. becomes something where we see that name on the side of a, a starship, that'll be something else. All right. Let's keep the questions coming here. Um, a good question from Daniel. With the new FCC filings, we'll talk about that. What do you guys think? Catch or no catch? So to catch people up, mm. uh, no pun intended, to catch people up on the FCC filings, and then we'll dive into the question. Uh, SpaceX filed some updated information for the upcoming FCC, or for the upcoming orbital test flight, and the FCC, as we've talked about many times before, is involved because they are in charge of looking at the radio frequencies and things like that. I should be interrupting myself because we are seeing something happen. What the heck is going on here? Looks like a piston of some kind is being moved by that crane. Ah, yes. We've been watching Starbase Live all day where they've been working on the chopsticks. Uh, we've been taking some close-up mm. looks at it, and they have been working on this piston, which they're now removing. So that's something where they've, obviously, with the recent test of chopsticks, which was in, uh, highlighted in the latest daily video, which I'll put in the chat in a second, 
it's something where they found obviously something he's replacing and they're telling it taking it out so i don't think that's any anything dramatic towards the flood for next week if they were planning for a static fire next week that wouldn't really affect it because they're not going to do the stack until well after that happens with both 24 and boost 7 so yeah that's what we're watching we're watching some repair work being taking place on the chopsticks so this Chris, ties directly in not, with this it's, oh go ahead uh, Nick. Hey Nick, we're, we're getting a little bit of uh, choppiness on your mic there. Well, I think we'll come back to you in just a second here. Um, but yeah, so we got a question here about why do we think the chopsticks were in the position that they are, and they were kind of near the bottom of the booster. I guess this answers that question. They're working on maintenance and replacing that. Um, so I guess that answers the question. Working on the chopsticks, hopefully it'll be a quick repair and it'll all be good in time for the orbital test flight, which of course is plenty of time from now. So. Um, I guess the next time they actually need the sticks is to stack the ship, which is another question. When would we expect a full stack of Booster 7 mm. and Ship 24? How far away are we from that, Chris? I'm going to go with... <laughs> I always get optimistic with this thing. <laughs> I'm going to go with a full stack event happening in one month from today. Well, maybe not today, because it'd be a Sunday, but one month's time. I think, did they, need month. A road, did they need a road closure for a full stacking? I can't remember. They did a. They closed the road for lifting the booster, right? Okay, right. So yeah, I'm so expect I would imagine lift ops are closers. So that more likely during the night on a weekday. I'm gonna go one month from today, next on a Monday. <laughs> okay, there you yeah. go. Um, not a bad timeline. Um, hey, I tell you what, that means we could do our first poll. <laughs> first, oh, you know, NSF live poll of the day. <laughs> oh, what? Well, when is the full? When full stack? Yes, when full stack. All right, what are the options going to be? Hold on, i got to pull up my YouTube page because uh, I want to vote point. on Yeah, this. I'm going to have to think of options here. I'm going to go... Uh, well, it's obviously going to be not, not next week or so. <sighs> this month? No, it won't be this month. Next month? Later. We'll go with we'll go with a 50-50 <laughs> poll because otherwise we'll get silly. We'll be like, ooh, October. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's the... I, and I'm going to come back to that. We had that catch or no catch question. We're going to pull that later too. But I'm going to come back to that question here because I want to talk about the full stack first. Um, well, obviously, what we'll have to see first is those static fire tests. And they're not going to stack until that's done. However, maybe they get to a point where they start doing spin primes, pre-burners, things like that on the booster. And they get... But they get to the point where they're ready for more static fire testing, but they want to fire so many yes. engines... That yeah. they need the ship stacked, right? No, um, very good point, yeah. So I wonder if they'll hit a point of booster testing where they're waiting for the ship to finish its own static fires, and then they'll do the full stack, and then do the final bit of booster static fire testing, and that also ties in like a full wet dress for ourselves, the full stack. Um, so that's kind of what I'm thinking along the lines of, and that could mean that the stack happens sooner. Um, simply because it won't be after the complete static fire campaign. It'll kind of be part way through. Basically, as soon as the ship's ready, they could do it. But anyway, yeah. Poll and chat. Um, I, I heard a, a couple of NSF lives ago, Chris went crazy with the polls, so I think we're just going to keep that did, coming because yes. chat likes it. So we'll <laughs> do some more polls. Um, looks like next month is a heavy favorite right now. There's optimism for you. I like that. We've got a very optimistic communi uh, community. And Not for it, nothing, and uh, this is nothing against chat. Whenever we ask a question about Starship stuff, I feel like chat is almost always optimistic. <laughs> uh, that's just me, though. Maybe I'm just pessimistic. I don't know. But anyway, let's keep the questions coming here, and let's dive back into this FCC question that we got as well. So the FCC yeah. filings were just an update on Starship or Starship SpaceX's plans for the Starship orbital test flight. Um, and it included an update on the flight profile, which we know is going to be something along the lines of obviously going into orbit. It's going to be carrying Starlink V2 satellites in some way, shape, or form. Um, but the booster, it has been the big question. What are they going to do with the booster? Are they going to try and catch it? Are they going to try and simulate a landing somewhere downrange, either with a partial boost back or with no boost back at all, to practice catching without risking a tower? Are they just going to expend the thing? Um... The FCC documents have basically said that SpaceX hasn't decided yet um, that they are considering both an abort into the water and a catch attempt. So, Chris, what do you think space is going to fall on this decision? You know, I always say what I think isn't important, but I'm going to do an L2 leak. I'm going to leak <laughs> L2 information live on air. 
I'm going to get myself banned from my own site. <laughs> but no, I'm going to use this in an article, so I'm going to, I'll just give you a, a heads up on this one. SpaceX don't tend to talk about these things, especially SpaceX employees, because they're on NDA. They just don't. I mean, that, that's the way it works, and that's fine. It's commercial. But NASA HLS is deeply involved, obviously, as you can imagine. And the NASA side do believe, uh, per one guy in L2, that they'll use a potential idea where, can you remember the booster that, Tried a land landing but didn't make it. It was a rare one. They had to they had to tow CRS, it back to Port Canaveral. It was a CRS. Hold on. Right. They oh, have a decision nice. point. They have a decision a decision a decision uh, a decision point come on the way back, where they can either continue with the return to land or they can abort over sea. And I be they believe that they'll have an option with Boost Seven that if it survives. And the big question was if it survives that far. If it survives to the point where it's going to come back in for its landing burn, they can divert at any point to a sea landing or they can continue on if they feel fully confident. It's just a question, really, of... I, see, I've seen two sides of the story. One, that they'll attempt a soft landing on water to get the parameters to say, look, oh, it's just pinpointed where we wanted it. That's great. The next attempt, we'll go back to the chopsticks because we've got confidence in this. And the other one was basically, look, you know, we're going to bring it back, bring it back, bring it back. And if at any point we're not confident, at any point of a return back, we'll abort it. And that's mm -hmm. where the example of the Falcon 9 booster being aborted during its return to land comes into play. They have a decision point. It's like almost like a pole. You know, they get <laughs> back to about 10 miles away. They'll go, right, pull, no go for return or not. And in that case, the grid fin gave away. So they were obviously spinning. They knew they had to abort it. But that yeah. that's something they could employ with with a super heavy booster. And that mission was CRS-16, by the way. Thank you, Alex, there we go. Thank you. Enough for helping us out. I know. I knew it was one of the old Cargo Dragon missions. I just never remember the number. CRS-16, the only time a return to launch site landing has failed in the entirety of Falcon 9. Fun fact. Uh, that was back in 2018. Um, but yeah, so I, I think I agree with you, Chris, and it, I, that makes seems to be the right decision because it would be also be weird, think of it this way, if the booster is performing perfectly on yeah. the way back, but you never gave it a shot to try the catch, then the next flight isn't really gaining you anything extra. You're just getting back to the point where you should have been on the last flight. Exactly. So if the booster can abort at any point during the return, why not give it a chance to say, listen, if everything is going perfectly, try the catch, because why not? That's the only way you're going to get farther in your test campaign. So um, that makes a lot of sense to me, and as long as they're confident in its ability to safely abort, I think that's kind of where we'll see. Anyway, uh, where I think Nick has moved to a new camera. I know Nick's been moving around, providing us different camera views. Nick, you back on comms with us now? I sure hope so. And uh, there you are. Yeah. We got you. Oh, okay, wonderful. Uh, yeah, I, the boost, the booster seven's uh, flight profile is definitely something I'm I'm keeping an eye on as uh, as I try to figure out what kind of shots I want to get during the first orbital attempt and where I want to be and stuff. It'll it'll be uh, interesting to see where they land this puppy. Yeah. Um... Here is another question. Um, your mom asks, thanks, YouTube. Very cool. Do you know why the static fire has been delayed? We were kind of in the static fire is imminent mode about mm. two weeks ago and haven't seen it yet. Uh, we Obviously, we know SpaceX likes to keep very optimistic schedules because um, that helps push the team to get things done, even if that means they don't necessarily meet the deadline. If you, know, if you push for a static fire a week from now and it ends up being two weeks from now, that's still faster than if you were aiming for a static fire three weeks from now, you know? So we see that schedule fluid kind of flow and move around a lot. What do you think the items for getting the boosters ready for static fire testing is? What's hold, What do they still need to finish up? I'm, you know, I'm not questioning if they're actually, if there's a holdup or a delay or anything like that. I think it's just natural flow. And I think it's a good sign as well, because if they rushed into this and lost the booster during a static fire test campaign, by going too early because they were keeping some kind of like very tight schedule, then that'd been worse than what they're doing right now, which is taking the time, making sure everything's right. I think the biggest challenge is not with the booster. I think it's with the actual ground support equipment, which such as the orbital launch mount, which is very complex. I always remember Elon saying that the orbital launch mount is more complex than the actual vehicle. That ground mm -hmm. uh, stage zero, as he calls it, stage zero is more complicated than the actual vehicle. And we've seen a lot of work during Starbase Live and on Mary and Nick's videos where they've been doing so much work around the booster on the orbital launch mount. I'm sure they're just getting things ready for that. But also, I think it's just a question of us being patient because it's very easy to get into a kind of like scheduling 
mindset where we we see some kind of inertis, such as the uh, I think it was the nerd dam or whatever it was, which mm. su suggested it was going to be a static fire last week. Oh yeah, the um, but, the notice the mariners, the the sea has. There we go. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah, that that was the one which got people very excited because no notice to Mary. We knew we weren't really going to see one until that notice was posted. Right. And that would be for what would be first spring prime, then pre burner. The pre burner would be one which would indicate the notice because that'd be required because an ignition source being used, and that's why they send the notice out. But I just recall an email I got from a, a very kind lady who asked me, she said she was booking flights on her holiday and she wanted to use the opportunity on the booking <laughs> site to book flights for the orbital launch type test and she wanted to know what day that was going to be. <laughs> and I had to break it to her slowly that there was absolutely no way. I couldn't even tell her. The, the no, there is no one that knows the answer to that question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's so two that weeks. Was, uh, two, two weeks, weeks yeah. <laughs> two. I could have just quoted Elon's tweet and said, "Well, Elon's is two weeks, so you know." <laughs> but no, I wasn't going to fall into that trap. <laughs> so, it, it, we've got to be patient. They're going to do this the right Very way. Smart. There's clever people there. They know what they're doing. We'll see it soon enough. Before you know it, we'll be going through static fire test campaign live streams. Yes, absolutely. Definitely. And and this and this and this transition is actually a really great sign. I think uh, being able to watch SpaceX move from. Uh, building starships and grass fields in South Texas to building up a whole facility around it to, uh, to support actual aerospace work. The, uh, the difference between what they've been doing previously and, and what they want to do is, is quite a big difference. The difference between like shipbuilding and uh, aerospace is huge. Yeah, there you go. All right, more questions here. Again, tag us at NASA Space Flight if you've got a question. There's a whole bunch of them here, so I'm going to keep them coming. Here's a question. How many Starlink V2s are planned to be launched on Booster 7 slash Ship 24? Um, I don't think we really know the exact plan. What, I mean, are would we expect them to do a full load of Starlink satellites? Or are they going to, like, hedge and only put one or two? Will they even be real satellites? Or will they be something that has the mass and shape of a Starlink satellite mm -hmm. but isn't actually operational for reasons of not risking real satellites yet? What do you think, Chris? If it was me, if I was Elon, I would put three real V2 Starlinks on board because that's less risk if they lose the vehicle. And it, let's let's face it, there's every chance they could lose the vehicle before he even gets mm -hmm. to space. So that's you know that's why it's a test flight, and people will need to be stressed on that point endlessly ahead of the launch because this is what test flights do: they find the faults and they fix them. And if you're going to lose a bunch of satellites in a test flight, Make it three, because if it does succeed and they do deploy three Starlinks, that's in a massive coup. Their first ever flight of this massive vehicle and they deploy operational satellites from it. That's just a huge statement to make. So I think that's a nice middle ground to just put three on and just try and launch those three and deploy those three. And if they don't succeed with it and lose it, it's no great big shakes because I'm sure companies like SpaceX can afford three lost Starlinks. Why three specifically? <laughs> I don't know. I just picked that number out randomly. <laughs> <laughs> but a, a small number is the point. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I got you. Um, also, a quick clarification when um, Chad was asking, FCC, don't you mean the FAA? No, I do actually mean the FCC. And the reason yeah. that the FCC, I mean, the FAA is also involved with a lot of this, but the FCC controls the radio frequencies that are used for things like telemetry and things like that. So the FCC is very involved with spaceflight across a lot of different things and launch licensing for telemetry signals is done through the FCC so they are that was that was not the qu person asking that question was very correct um we got a whole bunch of super chats and support that has come through i want to thank these folks really quick andrew says forget the ships nasa space flight you're all the stars oh we appreciate oh that, you can andrew. come again <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much uh brandon with some support also thank you uh stan with a question will a real payload be on board for the first flight yep a word on the street is that there'll be some starlink satellites um so again we were talking about we don't know how many exactly but uh spacex is planning to deploy um, test their deployment mechanism for the Starlink V2 satellites on the very first test flight. So that answers your question, Stan. Thank you. Um, and next question, will Ship 24 fly with Starlink satellites? I've answered this before. Yes, yes it will. <laughs> um, here you go. Musical Wolves, why not hop the ship to the booster for stacking? Oh, think they've got wow. the yeah. <laughs> I think they've got the chopsticks for that. But uh, listen, if you want to try it in Kerbal and let us know how it goes, I'll appreciate that. 
Um, and then here is a good question to discuss from Dale. Has SpaceX been denied for making their own liquid methane on site? If so, does that mean no more spicy food for the team? I don't know if it has anything to do with the food <laughs> that the, the workers they have, have for lunch, but uh, I do believe part of the environmental assessment basically shut down. I don't remember. Was it the methane production plant that got shut down? I want to make sure that detail is actually correct before I dive into this. I think they were looking for something more ambitious with that production site, which they got. Um, we saw rising about a year ago, was it now? I think it was. And I, I think they wanted to really kind of create their own propellant line where they're just driving down the road. But I even probably could have piped it down just the two miles between the, the production site. And how far, Nick, is the production site from the launch site? Is it about two miles? Uh, yeah, just about 2.1 miles. Uh, yeah, so that makes the, sense uh, to do a pipeline. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, yep. Definitely two you wouldn't want to be hauling big tankers down if you can avoid it, but uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, I've, that's the funny thing we've been watching this wave and wave of tankers. I knew that would happen because, and I'll bring it up during the shuttle program, we used to see the tankers arrive at 39A and 39B, waves and waves and waves of tankers before a shuttle would be launched, uh, would be in a pre launch countdown because they had to fill those massive spears, which they're going to be using at 39A and 39B for Starship and. Uh, SLS respectfully so it's something where people think, see these massive tanker trucks full of um in the shuttle's case lo liquid hydrogen liquid oxygen it was it was massive amounts I think it was 30 to 40 tankers per floor and they were doing stable replenish as well so they had to keep bringing the tankers through right. so I think that uh answers the question um yeah basically they will not be they, they, they were scaling back their production site plans um, as a result of the environmental assessment. Mm. Um, anyway, more questions here. Here's a good one, and maybe this has there's some, some shuttle heritage that we can leverage to answer this question. Mark Smith asks, what percentage of loss of tiles on Starship do you think would still allow the ship to return from orbit? Uh, yeah, yeah. Ooh, SDS 27. <laughs> there's, there's many examples where the orbiter came back with, with lost tiles and was fine. SDS 1 being the biggest one, they lost a lot of tiles in SDS 1 Columbia and returned fine. It's where you lose the tiles that's a key thing. And as we saw with Columbia, you don't want a, a serious amount of damage, which was the wing leading edge in that case, which is where most of the heat is directed during the rolls when you're returning. That was why Columbia could not have survived that in any circumstance. There's just there was no way. It was a horrendous, of course. But with Starship and a test flight, an uncrewed test flight, we can be more blasé because the only thing they're going to lose is the vehicle, not people. And that's the, right. that's the important distinction there. I think the key thing here is we may see some tiles fall off during a static fire campaign more than we will during a launch because when you're doing a static fire test locked down to the orbital launch mount or the launch mount itself which is the starship's on right now you've got more vibrations induced through the vehicle because you are bolted down and firing the engines up you've got more vibrations so when people see tiles fall off during a steady fire tank campaign they'll think well what's it gonna be like during launch it might even be less during launch so it's something where you've got to calibrate your expectations there but i'm also sure they've done many computational models where they can say well, we can lose x amount of tiles and still survive it fine it's not a massive issue if we do lose some tiles. Again, I would then point to where they lose the tiles as being the critical factor. So I'm sure we don't know the answer to that question, by the way, but I'm sure SpaceX do, that they don't want to lose certain tiles on certain places. We're zooming in right now on the TPS. Yeah, I was going to say, we're, we're, we're yeah. enhancing the view of heat shield tiles right now. So there we go. The, the models they'll have at SpaceX is where the peak heating will be on the vehicle as it comes back. Now I'm thinking of angle attack. I'm thinking the aft will be the belly front and belly aft will be the two main areas. Also on the aero surfaces as well. You can see more work's gone into the ones, the TPS around the aero surfaces where they'll be controlling the vehicle back. They need those flaps to stay nice and cool so they can operate fine. Mm -hmm. The nose cone looks very good. I'm very impressed by the nose as well. I mean, that looks like it really is ready for a dive back and then probably just the aero surface still tend to take the atmosphere and then belly flop it back like we've seen during the test flights. There's so many answers to so many questions we've not really heard yet and I think we'll see a lot of things for the first time during a test flight. I remember the first test flight to 15 kilometers 
we didn't even expect the engines to shut down. I do remember, Thomas, you were on that live stream and you were the first oh, person yeah. to say, oh, maybe that's planned, actually. <laughs> yeah, I, Whereas, I, I, I will totally claim that I, you know, was smart enough to notice and not just, you know, you randomly called it, speculating. But yeah. You called it because everybody else, including myself, was like, oh, they've lost a raptor. We'll keep going. We'll keep it. They've lost a raptor. They've lost two raptors. Oh. I think I said it after they lost the second one because it was like, it was working out too well. Like the vehicle was still very, cl very clearly under control and the timing of it was working out to like, it wasn't random enough. Like it wasn't the two shut down at the same time. Yeah. Like there was symptomatic <laughs> of some problem up upstream, if you will. Um, so yeah, I, I got lucky, but you know, you as a claim to fame, you got that spot on <laughs> because that was the first time we'd seen it. And they hadn't told us in advance. They did not say in advance. Right. This is our flight profile. So we were, we were basically just watching it live with everybody else. Just basically trying to work out how this thing was going. And then we all got distracted by the belly flop because the belly flop was spectacular. Yeah. It was like, this thing is actually coming down under control. Yeah, it's it was stable. Belly and, under yeah. control, my word. That was something else. And we've got more to look forward to this test flight. It's going to be absolutely spectacular, whatever happens. So, yeah, I'm absolutely. still looking forward to this. I also remember, because before the SN8 very first flight, I did some computer simulations to try and figure out what the flight profile would look like. And everything wow. I was doing was suggesting that it was going to go supersonic. And like I was imagining three engines at full thrust until you reach the speed you would need to reach 15 kilometers and then shut down, coast up to 15 kilometers, go into the belly flop orientation, and then basically do the landing burn maneuver. And But and but then we heard that like the... The, the flight was taking way longer because of the shutting down engines. And so my mm. my estimates were all off because I had not thought about, oh, well, we'll shut down engines on the way up to keep it, keep the thrust continuous on the way up and also just limit the speed and stay subsonic and all those things. So uh, we learned a lot on that very first test. And uh, wow, that was fun to watch. I cannot wait to watch more Starship test flights. Yep. All right, more questions here. Uh, Adam Baker asks, do you think that they'll static fire with a Starship on top? I think we are leaning in the direction of, in order to static fire all 33 engines, if and when SpaceX chooses to do that before flight, you need the weight of the fully fueled Starship on top. What do you think, Chris? I agree. I think they need the mass. Just mm -hmm. keep it on the orbital launch mount. I mean, the thing is bolted down, but it's it, it's it's not completely secure. It's, it's something that with that amount of thrust, <laughs> it's going to rise. So you don't want the thing falling off the launch mount. So the mass mm -hmm. of having the Starship on top makes perfect sense for the 33 firing. If they start with, say, six, I think they're okay. So they'll do an initial static fire test. They'll static fire Ship 24. They'll go for a full stack, and then they'll go for the 33 and I think that's a great one. That's almost like a launch countdown demonstration, like a, a you know, like a terminal test demonstration where they can literally go through a full countdown, fire up to 33, and then abort a few seconds after firing. And that is basically, that's their dress rehearsal for launch day. There you go. Uh, Dick, what do you think? Static fire with a sh full stack? Well, I it would make sense if they did it. But uh, I also could see them not doing it. Um, it. It would it would make a ton of sense to test it all at least once before you light it for real. Um, but also, why wait? So, I don't know. We'll see. Right. Um, we got some uh, super chests that have come in again. I really thank you to everyone who sends the support. Oh, really quick. I should wow. point out. What is going Nick, is this your view? No, that's not my view. Uh, that's the truck provided by Mary today. Uh, wow, that's that is, thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, that. Uh, thank and thanks, Michael, for pointing it there. I, I noticed that, but I don't have a good lens for it. The, it looks like some crews are finally up on the uh, little extension piece of the tower, building something up there. Uh, it's a lightning protection system, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Uh, maybe, or or you know, maybe a nice viewing platform for Elon to watch <laughs> launch from. You know, <laughs> one of the two. I don't know. <laughs> We Elon's are expecting thinking... a lightning tower at some point for the yeah, right no. period. <laughs> yes, too, yes. too late. It, I reckon it was going to be a lightning protection system, but if Elon's <laughs> listening, he's now thinking, hang on a minute. That's a great idea, Nick. I'm having that. Actually, <laughs> actually I think it's actually going to be a, a tower where we can have DOS stick a camera on. Uh, that, oh, that'd, that'd be, be nice. Easy. Oh, that'd yeah. be cool. That'd yeah. be cool. <laughs> Dear SpaceX, please may we... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, some workers high up there on the launch tower. Man, I... Wow, I, yeah. <laughs> one of those engineering jobs I don't think I envy, but uh, there you go. Um, just some scaffolding there to work up there. 
Uh, but all right, back to these questions and things. Um, Jim says that, and this is back to the poll either, that they think they'll attempt the catch with the option to ditch, and I think that's kind of where I'm leaning to um, with regards to the first orbital test flight. Um, okay, here's a hmm, interesting question. Without an inner stage, is there a concern that Starship will not make it through max Q? Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so to clarify, it's not that it doesn't have an inner stage. Basically, the upper stage engines are within sort of a, their own, I guess you call it engine bay. The, the, think of it as the inner stage is attached to the upper stage rather than attached to the first stage like it normally is. Um, if you remember Saturn V, for example, the inner stage was actually attached to the stage above it. And after the stages separated, the engine started, there actually was a separate staging event to drop the shroud or the inner stage from the engines. Um, obviously Starship won't do that because the goal is to protect the engines during re-entry and things like that. Um, so it's not like it doesn't have an inner stage. So I'm not, and I'm also not entirely sure how this question ties in with Max Q. Um, I don't know if, if, I'm not sure the angle to the question, to be honest. I hope something I said there was helpful. <laughs> Let me see what other questions we have here. Um... Here's, oh, here's a good one. Neil asks, are the chopsticks on the ocean-facing side of the tower? I think this is relevant to the landing profile. Yes, they are. They are. So the booster should be, theory, coming in from the ocean towards the side of the tower that the chopsticks are on. From what that we can would, tell, yeah. Yeah, which, that makes a lot of sense. So good question there, Neil. Good. To, to, I've never actually thought about that, but that makes a lot of sense. What else? Um, oh, a, a good clarification here. I saw this message from Jaden that said that Elon said several times that the first flight wouldn't be near orbital, not fully orbital. Um, this has changed. At a time, that was true, but this has changed. And in fact, I think he, it was the most recent mention is in the recent interview with Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. If you haven't checked that out, highly recommend. Um, but I believe in there, he talked about how the flight profile has changed. There's going to be Starlink satellites on the first flight. Um, and they will be deployed into an actual orbit. Um, again, the plans are still fluid, um, and the exact details of what the Apogee and Perigee will be is not known yet. But um, that plan has been fluid and has changed since those comments, Jaden, so that is why um, we're not super surprised about the Starlink satellites being on board, because um, the expectation is that they will not immediately re-enter. All right, uh, some other super chats really quick. Ryan says, hashtag Chris B. Thomas and Nick fan club. Appreciate Yay. that. Um, <laughs> Lucas, thank you for being a Pad Rat member. Really appreciate that and joining on. Also, uh, Julian with a new Pad Rat membership as well. Thank you so much. Uh, Plutonium with uh, no message, just some super chat support. So we appreciate that. Um, and then, oh, here's a good, good question. It's a speculation question for the record because i don't think we any of us know the answer but houston asked do we think that the starlinks on the orbital test will attempt to raise into operational orbits or will they test the demisability or the re-entry survivability mm. of those satellites for future safety planning and things like that oh that's a good question you know i'm going back to the the thing that elon tweeted out which showed the deployment sequence of starlinks where basically starship is puretting and Deploying via the Pez dispenser, these Starlinks. And by the way, they were about two at a time. So my, my guesstimate of three on the test flight is now four. <laughs> because uh, I want to I wanna go into twos now. I want to go. Okay. You know, I want to up upgrade my estimate on how many were on the test flight. But it, it, the way they were basically deploying them suggested they were being put into an initial deployment area. And then they would then raise. So I'm thinking maybe they'll test that rather than anything else. Again, we're, we're getting to a point here. We're getting a, we could get away, ahead of ourselves slightly here. The thing has got to survive the, the launch, first of all. Right. And then they're going to get to the point where they can deploy them. If they get to the point they're going to deploy them, that's a massive win, whatever happens after that with the test flight. So then to even think about what will happen to the deployed Starlings on that test is almost like a, a massive bonus feature in itself. I think that the V2 satellites, because they are V2s, will have that capability of just being deployed en masse via that sequence we saw in Elon's tweet video, and then be able to put themselves into the operational plane that they want to be in. So I'm going to go with that. I'm going to go with they're going to be able to raise themselves in that manner. 
Well, interesting, and this ties in with another um, question that we've just gotten here. Dank Jeb pointing out that the FCC has not actually approved Starlink V2 at all yet. Um, so, in theory, if SpaceX is ready for the first Starship orbital test flight before the FCC approves deployment, they might not be allowed to actually deploy those satellites into the operational orbit. Um, they might have to immediately re-enter. So that's an interesting piece of the puzzle there. Um, they could get, I, I don't know if there's some sort of temporary or like kind of um, near term, like, hey, can we get permission to just launch, like you said, four satellites or something? Yeah. Um, which might be easier to approve rather than the full constellation. They could do something like that. Um, but we haven't seen any of that yet. So that's another thing to keep an eye on and it could give us a hint as to what exactly the payloads will do on that flight. Uh, let's see here. Um, here's a good question from David. Elon has alluded to the complexity of starting Raptor 2 engines. And this again, this is from the Elon Tim Dodd video interviews as well. Any thoughts on the startup sequence and the risk to static fire and or restarting in flight, referring to both the booster and the ship, which both have to do that? Um, you can yeah. mitigate the liftoff risk, right? Because you're still on the launch pad. Yeah, those... The process to relight these Raptor engines are very complicated. Uh, there's just so many things that need to go wrong, from valves opening at the precise millisecond to temperatures being exactly the right temperature. And so SpaceX is obviously working as hard as they can to remove as many variables as they possibly can. But at some point, they're going to just have to roll the dice and risk it and uh, see how many of these 33 do uh, do light at the right time in the right sequence. Um, so that's, I think, what the static fires will be about. And as far as uh, launching it um, and then relighting those later, uh, I would not expect Merlin levels of reliability for a little while. Um, I think we'll get to that point. But uh, yeah, I think it'll be a little sketchy for a while. What do you think, hey, well Chris? We've got a new poll. Um, first of all, when, st when full stock next month was 76%. Out of two point two, uh, two and a, two thousand two hundred votes, and we've got a new poll up now. If you want to join that as well, you can read it as he says. Um, as far as the answer to the question, uh, yeah, I, I, I honestly don't know right now. I'm, I don't want to get too far ahead on what the, the sequence will be until we've seen one, because I think we're going to go to McGregor Live for some indications of how Raptor 2 is performing and how it starts up and how it performs, how it shuts down, the honk, things like that. So it's it's really a case of we're seeing single engine firings right now. What they'll be like with multiple engines firing is yet to be seen, and I, I'm just intrigued to see what it'll be rather than guessing myself. Sure, sure. Uh, let's see, uh, we've got a few more questions coming in. Thank you so much, Chad. Chad's just keeping the questions coming, and I really appreciate that. It makes my job easier. Um, what are the two missing rows of tiles on ship 24? Um, we've seen them for this with pretty much every ship that's been rolled out, is the, um, missing, like, they haven't com fully completed the heat shield before they rolled out. I don't know if that's just a result of they're never quite done by the time they're ready to roll out and they can do more out of the pad. Um, but the, those rows will get, we're expecting that to get filled in um, is the, the, the upshot of yeah. this. If, if you look at what kind of tiles they, uh, they wait to fill in, they're typically the bonded type, the ones that do not use pins. They have to basically glue them on. And uh, those two rings uh, definitely do look like uh, they are the bonded type. And so that gives you a little bit of idea of uh of why they might wait a little bit don't want to don't want to <laughs> crack the glue or anything while you're moving it uh too much and uh yeah so they'll be done and uh circling back to this is something we touched on earlier as well but it's relevant to mcgregor live as well um abbreviations such as sp and pb so we were talking about this because it has <laughs> to deal with starship too um chris i'll it's all you <laughs> Oh, sorry. We're, uh, yeah, chat commands. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are uh, chat TV. commands there we go. for both of those abbreviations. It's for the spin prime testing and pre burner testing. Yes. Um, you just put night exclamation, mark, exclamation mark, SP, exclamation mark, PB, and the night bot will be along shortly to explain what those two are. But I, I was too busy putting McGregor <laughs> chat well, command into there so people could well, see McGregor at the same time. Too many things to link in chat. <laughs> yep. Uh, but yeah, so. so 
That's a great question because it has come up in conversation a lot more frequently. So for those who are not familiar with the acronyms, we want to make sure everyone's on the same page. So thank you for asking. And that's uh, for if you see anyone else in chat asking what that means, you can now help them out with the handy dandy nightbot command. Um, okay, so we're going to keep the questions coming again. Tag us at NASA Space Flight in chat. I also want to thank everyone who has been supporting the stream with Super Chats, memberships, things like that, and just tuning in. We appreciate all of you. If you are looking for another way to support what we do at NASA Space Flight, the NSF store is obviously a fantastic way as well. And the reason I'm bringing it up now is because we have a new deal running. It has literally just started for this episode of NSF Live. It'll be live through, I think, today's Starlink Commission. So limited time offer. If you buy two or more metal prints, you get 15% off the new metal prints. So... This, these are prints of NASA Space Life photos. We've got an SLS photo there, Falcon 9 photo, a bunch of different Starship photos are in there. And if you buy two or more, that is 15% off your metal prints when you order. So if you are looking to up your wall art, I've got, I mean, Chris, you've got some metal prints, yeah. I think, and they're fantastic, right? You know what? I would not put my reputation as much as this. <laughs> I'll put no rep reputation online by by literally going on record and saying this. But when I got the first one, it came really well packaged. Now I always I've always liked the NSF stores packaging because it it comes through like you know we've basically hand delivered it. It's it's really good. But it, it came in such great packaging. It was in great condition. It was never going to get damaged on route because of the way it was packaged. And it comes with with these magnets in the back, magnet mounts you can optionally put on the back of it for helping me put in the wall. It, it really is brilliant quality. I was super impressed with it. So I am now really going to be pressing the likes of Mark and Co and Pauline to sort of like do more metal prints because now I know the quality is fantastic and the size is massive and the price is actually a lot cheaper than I've seen other places stores where they do metal prints that we're going to do a lot more of these. They are very good quality prints. So yeah, I'm I'm happy to put my name onto them. And if anyone comes back and says, Chris, you told me the metal prints were great. <laughs> I can be rest assured no one would in a, in a, with a straight face tell me they're not because they really are. And of course, this particular photo that we were just showing there is from Nick. So Nick has contributed to the metal print collection there. Um, so again, buy two or more, 15% off. And uh, you can check out the awesome photography from the very talented NSF photographers. All right, back into some questions here. Thank you, everyone, for your support. Um, Muzo with a question. Do we know how far along SpaceX are with the 75 requirements for the finding of no significant impact, the mitigated FONSI, uh, which is that FA environmental assessment that had those 75 things they have to fix yeah. before the orbital test flight? We don't really have any insight into that, do we? No, there's there's no um, live update website from, <laughs> from yeah. the officials where it shows, right? They're down to 63. <laughs> it, it's something where I actually think they've been working on these things already before that came out. And at the 75 was kind of like where they were before they told sure. SpaceX and then they finished off the documentation because a lot of it was turtle, sea turtle related. And th there's no harm in that because everyone loves the sea turtles. Oof. We saw these special little sea turtle patrol vans from SpaceX already out there well before this documentation was released. Mm -hmm. So I think SpaceX may have ticked off a lot of those 75 in advance of it being told and publicized as it was 75. How many have got left to go? I don't know. We don't right. know. They're not saying, but I would just mention that the fact is I don't think SpaceX has got the documentation as we saw it when it was released and thought, right, 75 to go. I think they're way down the list already. And of course, Nick, with the perfect timing with this new camera view with the wildlife crossing sign, Ooh. couldn't be placed better. Wonderful. So appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's actually one of the things that we saw pop up within a few days of the uh, uh, PPA uh, being announced. They have a bunch of these new wildlife crossing signs. So it's cool to see nice. that they've uh, taken such an initiative on that and getting it all cleared up so quickly. There you go. Um... Yeah, just also worth noting that the, I think the biggest thing to look for with regards to them finishing those requirements, the biggest sign will be when a launch license comes out. Um, once that's been issued, you know that they've satisfied the requirements, and that's really the next big thing we're looking for. And that will probably take some time, um, but they also have to get to flight readiness with the hardware anyway, so we're going to be looking at that in the meantime. All right, let's see. Next question um, If Starship 24 goes orbital, would it need solar panels? If it's only going to do like one um, orbit, it probably the onboard batteries are probably sufficient for that. Yeah. Um, 
solar panels will come on when you get to the human landing system version then it goes to the moon or any variant that's going to need to be on orbit for any extended period of time obviously the mars variant is going to need solar panels um, but for low earth orbit missions you can probably do without most upper stages that just deploy satellites don't have any sort of solar panels or anything the onboard batteries just last long enough um, so that's probably what we expect um, maybe the battery load is a little bit more because it does need to survive re-entry and then do a landing and all that um, but i don't think we would expect solar panels on every variant and especially not the very first test flight i also think that spacex is quite handy with the batteries because they have a certain company called tesla who can help yeah. them out with that. So <laughs> they have a good I'm... friend at this company named tesla that yeah. uh, knows how to make a battery so <laughs> Um, also, the second part of this question, those six small black hexes um, that we see below the SpaceX logo, again, not super clear what they are. Um, those are not solar panels, though. I think we can safely say that's not what that is. Um, they would have to be much bigger, but um, haven't really heard what those are, but there's a picture of them. Um, I don't know, you, Chris, you said that you think it represents the six engines. Uh, well, I was guessing that. I just, when I first <laughs> saw six, I thought, hang on a minute, that may be representing the six engines because it, it, to me, it looks decorative. It doesn't look functional, so... It is, like, very conveniently right in the middle, right where the logo looks really good. So, like, yeah. I could see that. Um, I don't know. I could also be some sort of antenna. Like, that would be the side of the vehicle that you'd put an antenna on, especially, like, during re-entry if you wanted to connect to Starlink or something. I don't know. I'm yeah, not Chat is convinced expert. they're Starlinks. I, but Starlink's antenna don't look like that, so that doesn't yeah. actually... Like, something's missing. I need more information. SpaceX, let us know. <laughs> All right, let's see. Some other support here. Julian with some super chat of support. No message, just some support. So we appreciate that. Um, <laughs> Ash just says, sup nerds in parentheses, Thomas. What, I'm the only nerd here? I don't know if that's accurate. But uh, I appreciate the compliment, I guess. Uh, how long would it take Starship to reach lunar orbit from the time of launch? So, I mean, getting to low Earth orbit takes like eight, nine minutes or something. Yeah. Um, you sit in the parking orbit for, I don't know, you probably coast for, well, actually from, depends on where you launch from. If you launch from KSC, you actually launch directly into the right inclination for a translunar injection. So you sit in the parking orbit for, I don't know, less than, let's say on average, 30 minutes or something. And then you do your TLI and that usually lasts two days or three days yeah. so it, it's you know three days ish um from liftoff to arriving at the moon for orbital insertion there that totally varies though depending on when you launch uh, depends on how much payload you bring because if you're bringing less payload you can fly a less efficient but faster trajectory which is sometimes useful um and that is a trade-off that spacex can make on a mission by mission basis so it's on the order of a couple days um and that is just thanks to the laws of physics uh, good question, though. Thank you. Um, here's another question. A lot of people asking about the Elon interview uh, with Tim Dodd. Um, what do you all think the secret sauce for ignition is on Raptor 2? They mentioned that they removed the torch igniters from the main combustion chamber. That's what the question is about. And uh, Elon basically said, I can't tell you how we fix that, um, which means that I have no idea. <laughs> if um, Elon's not going to say, we're not going to know. So. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not about to speculate on that. I am not a propulsion expert. With regard, like propulsion is not my expertise. Um, I know the very basics of rocket propulsion, but I could not speculate as to the secret sauce for Raptor Two. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's some kind of hot sauce. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Makes <laughs> sense. <be> hot. <laughs> yep, that's the secret sauce. Clue was in the actual hint. Um, Musical Wolves ask, is NASA, also known as the National Acronymic Support Administration, in charge of rocket acronyms? I don't think so. No. They do have lots of acronyms, but uh, SpaceX does, tries to avoid acronyms a lot, actually. I think we've heard that Elon doesn't really like acronyms, which makes sense. You want a more memorable name than a couple letters sometimes. Um, some ones are obvious, like NASA is, I think, universally known at this point. But um, yeah. All right, uh, another question here from Steve. Do you think that they'll add protective covering on the tower before the orbital test launch? I'm going to say no, but I think that's the eventual plan, to clad it like 39A's FSS has been cladded. Uh, I can't remember if it was cladded before DM1. Oh, I can't remember. 
But I, I think that's not eventual... before demo one. I don't think. Right. Yes. Yeah, so... There were several Falcon Nine launches before they collided thirty nine A. Okay, so that's what I'm thinking. Maybe just for the test flight, especially to try and bring it back. <laughs> and I might end up damaging it. There's no oh, point cladding it. And, you know, they're going to just lose the, clad and lose the cladding again. So it'd be something where I think that's the eventual plan. But I don't think they'll clad it before the test launch. In fact, if based on the fact that this may happen, may happen, and <laughs> big caveat here, in a month or so, it's time. I don't think they've got the time to complete it. So I think that's something that will happen in the future, but not for the first flight. Yeah, and so... Here, thank you, Alex, in the back channel. Again. Alex just pulls all of this info from anywhere. I don't get it. Uh, but the t the crew tower at 39A was painted for demo one, but not cladded. So it go. did look different by that point, but it wasn't fully finished. That's um, what I was thinking. I th yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think the big point is it's not so urgent that they need it. Like, they it's not required for the test flight. Um, so they'll kind of add it when they get to it. Also, not to be too much of a pessimist, but the chances of the tower no longer being there after the first catch attempt is not zero. Um, which to me says maybe they'll stick with what they've got for now. And then once the catches are like, oh, hey, we know how to catch a booster. Then maybe you put the finishing touches on it. I don't know. Maybe that's not how SpaceX is thinking. You, but you know, I want to quickly, I want to quickly touch on this. If... They try and catch the booster, say they commit to it, and the booster goes wrong and something, and it, it basically crashes into the tower. Into the tower, I don't think the tower will be destroyed. I, I don't think there'll be that much right. It's, it's, left. Yeah, that's like worst case scenario. I'm talking yeah. about. It could totally survive a failed catch. Still, I think. I think the worst thing that could happen is if the booster comes back and just <laughs> diverts the last second into the tank farm. That would be the worst thing that could happen. I would say. So I, I'm, you know, again, I think they'll have gone over this endlessly what happens if and i think they'll trade off the risks and then go on that but i don't think the tower itself will be destroyed because it's just basically it's 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 big tower of steel it's going to be okay and that's where the cladding comes in because if it's cladded that's the thing that'll blow off if it's going to basically get have an explosion when it comes back down again so yeah i'm just going back to the test flights that didn't land with starship and look at hopper hopper kept on smiling there was no damage to Hopper, so you know it's it's not that dramatic when it it comes back and crashes. So yeah, I, again, let's just go back to the whole tower being destroyed scenario. I don't think there is a scenario where the tower gets destroyed. Right. Um, with on the conversation of sort of mitigating that, though, we've actually got a pair of questions that are about this. First of all, Jacob asks, "Do we think that they'll fly the booster or ship alone again as part of this test campaign, perhaps to test the catch sequence?" Um, also, a follow-up question from Doug. Excuse me, why not test the catch mechanism by using only a few engines on the booster, lifting up a very short distance, and then catch it? So along the same lines there. Man. I think SpaceX has kind of reached the point where, obviously with Starship, they've done the whole flip and burn sequence, and I think they're at the point where there's not much data to be gained by flying the ship all on its own. The catch sequence is one thing, but I think SpaceX is at that point where more data would be received by doing a orbital test flight, which could include a catch attempt. Is that kind of where you're thinking, Chris? Yeah, I do. I think that's where we got. So that's the stage we're at now. What do you think, Nick? Oh, did we lose Nick? We might have lost Nick. Sorry, I muted myself because uh, oh, no. it Sorry. happens. <laughs> um, so maybe I was maybe I was talking and y'all couldn't hear me earlier too. Uh, makes a lot of sense, actually. Um, yeah, I, I don't really know uh, if. Yeah, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't expect them to, to fly them separately again. I mean, they've had ample opportunity to do that with Ship 20 and Booster 4. Um, kind of seems like most of the data that they needed was already gathered and uh, and or simulated. So I can't imagine them needing to do many more single tests. Gotcha. Yeah, I'm kind of with you there. Um... Really quick, Jim Cavett says a Mary and Nick Cooler Fund to Super Chat. So thank you so much. I know Mary and Nick out there greatly appreciate it. Uh, we'll make sure we send them that way. Um, and then, okay, we've already had this cow pun in chat. The cow puns are back. Uh -oh. Yes, when we finally launch cows uh -oh. into orbit, it will be the herd shot around the world. That was the original <laughs> cow pun. That's what started all no. of this. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for the support there and a quick poll update thomas how much money would it take to make you do that 
a top of the tower job. A heck of a lot was 55%. I'd do it for free was 44%. <laughs> for the record, I voted for that it would take a heck of a lot. Option. Yeah, I did too. Yeah. So, uh, there you go. Luckily, I am, I, my understanding is that SpaceX engineers get paid fairly well. So, I'm sure they're being compensated just fine. <laughs> um, anyway, more questions here. Dank Jeb, thank you for saying this in chat. Says, Thomas, did you forget about the refueling of HLS? That will add some time. Yes, and I recognize the angle of the question better now. If you were launching a Starship with no payload and you didn't need to refuel, it would take a couple days. If you need to refuel, such as preparing for HLS operations or um, carrying some other sort of payload to the moon, you are going to have to sit in orbit for refueling. And that could take, I mean, that could take, days or weeks even. It depends on how frequently they're launching the tankers. Um, at a certain launch cadence, if they can fly multiple times a day, um, even if it's like three, let's say let's say three refillings a day, um, the, we've heard anywhere from like three or four to like 15 refuelings required, depending on the payload and stuff like that. There's a lot of unknowns in here. So I think we would be in the range of, you know, less than a month sitting on orbit is what my guess would be assuming a pretty decent um, refueling cadence. The other part of it is when do you start the count? Because those refuelings happen before you actually launch the ship that's going to the moon. Um, the You launch a propellant depot, which is like the first launch, which is a starship that just has fuel tanks. I don't even know if they plan to recover it or they just leave it on orbit as a depot that they can reuse. Um, mm -hmm. Then you launch the tankers up and back a bunch of times to fill the depot. Once the depot is full of fuel, you launch HLS, docks to the depot, you transfer all the propellant at once, and then that way HLS isn't sitting on orbit for forever, waiting for all the refillings. So I think that, depending on how you count the timer, could be weeks to a couple months even. Uh, but if you count how long the HLS spends, or whatever the ship actually going to the moon spends, it should be less than a week, I think. I don't know if Chris or Nick has anything to add to that. Uh, yeah. No, so other than... Sorry, other than uh, the HLS refueling cycle is going to be a lot of launches, so that's something to look forward to in itself. It's yeah. going to be multiple, multiple launches. Just feels so far in the future that it's hard to wrap my mind around those things. Um, NASA Space Life fan points out that if SpaceX doesn't like acronyms, it doesn't make any sense because the X in the name is an acronym. Fun fact, SpaceX stands for Space Explorations Technologies Corporation. That's the real company name. So a very good point there. Appreciate the chat message. Um, here's a very interesting question I want to ask both of you. If the orbital test launch is successful, what kind of timeline might we expect for plans going forward after that? Hmm. Hopefully hmm. quickly. Hopefully quickly. Quickly, that'd hope. be good, yeah. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of the reason assuming this is successful a lot of the reason for its success will be because they did take their time with it you know they caught a lot of problems i mean look at the uh the issue they had with the uh the booster transfer tube with booster seven a while ago like there's all these little things that they're catching on the ground and they're able to fix with each one of these ships and taking their time does allow them to have a greater chance of success i guess so you know could be soon could be could be later i don't know also, isn't there a, a set amount of launches that can only complete at Starbase with this FAA documentation? Something like six in a year or something like that. So you might five, be, yeah. yeah, so you might then be seeing some kind of like maybe push to accelerate KSC. Now, the tower is going up pretty fast. I think they're going to have the launch site ready before long. But Roberts Road itself is a long way away from being in a position where you can start producing starships and boosters. Right, yeah. So I think we don't get into the situation where maybe they'll start thinking, okay, if we get into a launch position with KSC and we get everything ready to go there, we might have to send some boosters and ships to KSC, which is a big point people have been making about how they transport such vehicles there. So that's something to wait and see if that can be done and if it will be done and if they are in a position to be even contemplating that because we are we are working on the premise that the test flight gets to a point where they get into a position where they're confident they can have an operational flights. So, yeah, a lot of hurdles to pass first before they get to that point. Right, sure. Um, here is some more questions here. Um, 
Uh, super chat question. Elon said that the first flight booster would come back for a soft landing. Do we assume this includes a period where it hovers as if the chopsticks were moving? So yeah, the, we've seen kind of an idea of what the chopsticks landings might look like, where basically the booster hovers next to the tower long enough to be caught. Again, that should be like on the order of a second or two, because you don't want to be wasting all that propellant. Um, but I think, yeah, I think if they go for like a soft splashdown of some kind instead of a catch attempt, that would hopefully unless the reason that they're doing that is that the booster has detected something wrong and it's not safe to light the engines then it might just be a terminal velocity splashdown um, but if it's still healthy enough to do some sort of simulated landing out over the water though i would imagine yeah they basically do a landing burn um, they did that with falcon 9 um, the very first falcon 9 like landing attempts were actually just simulated out in the ocean to practice the landing burn um, so i would imagine something similar for super heavy would make a lot of sense I can actually get a little claim to fame from NSF here. Oh, the, yeah, that's true. Soft landing, yeah. The first soft landing was a Falcon 9 V1.1 with CRS-3 Dragon. And the video they got back was corrupted. And Elon tweeted out, you know, we need some help with this video because it's corrupted. And the NSF community suddenly magically found all, because we've got a massive community on the site. We had video repair um, specialists in there, and they all worked on it endlessly the point that they repaired i'm going to put the the article in there because elon thanked us in a video the nsf oh, yeah, community there we go. repairing Thank it you, yeah so we just put it into there because that was an amazing amazing process where we actual the actual repair thread which came after that were before that i should say was just endless amounts of posts people going through every bit of data and just repairing the video and that helped them get some important data on what soft landing was like with the falcon 9 which probably helped them in the long run to get the successful landings they're having now that's crazy. That's back in May of 2014. Well, That's Elon saying, yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, Elon mentioned it at, at a press event, like, thanks to that space flight or something, and he tweeted about it. There's a video of the video, like, before and after the NSF community was working on it. This is such a... Yeah, look at this. This is the... This is not... Your stream is not broken. This is the original video yeah, that SpaceX had. had of the... This is the CRS-3 mission. So you get an idea how far along that... How far ago that was. And then here's the repaired video. It starts off kind of the same. But uh, once you get to the actual, like, touchdown... There you go. You can, you can, like, start to make out the actual, like... The burn and the landing... There you go. And you get some, you get some much more recovered frames near the end. It's actually a very... Um, big difference. Um, there's a whole forum thread about it. You can check it out over on NASA Space Flight. Um, but uh, yeah, there you go. There it is. Like that, that yeah. That's funny. Wow. But yeah, That's so that gives you an idea. <laughs> that, that, those are the very early. That was before I worked at NSF. That was before Nick was involved with NSF. Um, yep. Before. Starbase was a thing. Like <laughs> that was Nathan um, Koga doing a CGI version of it as yeah. well for us. Yeah. And ironically, that water landing, that that a lot of people were asking what water landing would look like. That's because they've obviously got into Starship later on in the process compared to where they are now. So they're probably they're only used to sort of like seeing successful landings on drone ships and that right, landing sites, uh LZs. But before, when they first started trying to land these things, they came back to water and hovered over the water, hovered over the ocean, and then would just tipple over on the ocean and just basically be, you know, expanded that way. But that's where they got the initial data for what the landing moment would be like, the pinpoint accuracy would be like, and then they had lots of unsuccessful landings on drone ships before they finally got it right. With the Orbcom mission, I think it was Orbcom mission, it was actually the return to flight mission yeah. from the loss of the CRS mission where they actually got the thing back to LZ-1. Uh, the first successful booster landing of a Falcon 9, and now it's commonplace. It's, now it's routine. Routine is a horrible word in space flight, but now they've made it routine. Yeah, of course. All right, let's see. I'm going to keep the questions coming here. Uh, Everyday Space Nerd asks, do you think that SpaceX will land humans on the moon before Artemis 4? Yes, because the first landing is Artemis 3. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> I think that the point of the question maybe might be would they land humans on the moon before Artemis? Um, and the answer to that is almost certainly no. First of all, for SpaceX to do a moon landing without SLS, for example, which is obviously Artemis only, you would need to either modify Crew Dragon to fly to lunar orbit or load humans, like dock a Crew Dragon to Starship in low Earth orbit or dock uh, rather to the HLS specifically variant. 
and then go all the way to the moon, which isn't really how HLS is designed to do. It's probably theoretically possible, but again, we've seen no plans of them trying to do that. Um, or you would need to crew rate the super heavy booster, which that is going to take a lot of time before you can actually launch humans from the surface of Earth on Starship and Super Heavy, like instead of a Crew Dragon or SLS that docks later. Um, so first of all, first Artemis, crewed Artemis landing is supposed to be Artemis 3, and that will be the SpaceX Starship variant that is HLS. Um, and of course, but that'll be crew launched on SLS and then docked with Starship. Um, that is the current plan, and SpaceX has not talked about any plans to land people on the moon before then. There will be an uncrewed landing demonstration before they put crew on it. Um, they are going to do an uncrewed landing as part of the Artemis program. So there is that. All right, let's see. Um, here you go. Matt asks, would it not be better to use a test tank to hover over and test the catching arms instead of dropping one from space? New use for the test tanks? What do you think? That's a really good <laughs> idea. I, I think Ship 22 would like to volunteer, seeing how it hasn't done anything. Maybe Hoppy will make a comeback, too. Hoppy? Oh, no, we can't risk Hoppy. Hoppy has to sit on the ground where it's safe and can't get hurt. Yeah, Hopper's the OG. Hopper's now the guardian of the pad area and will forever be the one that'll be there. Probably when we got a city on Mars. Hopper will still be there, all rusted. Sat star base going, I remember when I was young, I used to 150 meter hops. Do you think they'll ever move Hoppy anywhere else? Like maybe to either Never. a museum or maybe to Mars? No, I think they'll build a museum Mars. around Hopper because Hopper okay. is now stuck there permanently. Starbase <laughs> is Hopper's home. The OG, and I think if they ever move Hopper, there'll be mass complaints on the internet saying, you can't take Hopper away. I well, let's go to, to the Smithsonian, Nick. Actually, to be fair, send Hopper to the Smithsonian. <laughs> I, would, I would agree with the Smithsonian or my backyard, one of the two. Oh, I see where you're going with that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Along with some raptors. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, just going to acknowledge what we're seeing on screen right now. The folks, are, oh, the, the SpaceX no. teams are back at it at the scaffolding, which again, I'm not super... It's Maybe it's just not for me, but now they're like they're carrying something up, up there. I can't even tell what that is. It's a raptor-sized ninja star. I just heard that from my, from my sources. It's <laughs> definitely it? a ninja star. Oh, wait. <laughs> All right, it's a, it's... shout out to Patrick in the back channel. Totally yep. knows what this is. That is a weather sensor mount. Yep. It looks identical to the picture he just sent. Wow. All right, so that the, so they're for weather data from the top of the tower. That makes a lot of sense. I'm still questioning how they're getting it up there, but there's the there's the example picture. Thank you, Michael. Um, but there you go. I'm still questioning how they're getting it up there, but I'm good for them. <laughs> Why didn't they send us an email? Let's just check our spam folders in case they said, oh, you yeah, want a camera on there as well? <laughs> Be real nice. Oh, we missed the email. Damn. Uh, I feel a little shaky. Listen, if they need someone yeah, to climb be. to the top of the launch tower and put a camera there, I would love to... I, w I would volunteer as tribute to go onto the launch tower if they yeah. need someone. You know? Oh, we're, we're going to have to have a fist fight over that one. No, <laughs> no Nick <laughs> might get dibs. He is there. <laughs> Ah, uh, there we go. Let's see. Um, uh, John asks, if the booster does damage the cables for the chopsticks, is there a braking system similar to an elevator to keep them from crashing down? I don't know if we know the answer to this question, but I'm asking it anyway. I do not know for sure either way, but it would make sense to put some kind of e-brake system on that. I second Nick's answer. <laughs> And um, for the UK audience, that's a handbrake. <laughs> ah, right, yes. Right. Handbrake for the lift. Got it, yes. Yeah. So, okay, we've seen Fast and Furious. We know what an e-brake is now. <laughs> um, here's a good question from Starship Happens. Good name. Um, wouldn't boil-off limit the time for filling up the tanker, referring to the propellant depot? Um, uh, or will they have a recondenser? They probably won't need a recondenser, but I think the orbital like refueling depot could simply be a much more insulated version of Starship. Like the tanks could have a whole bunch of extra insulation to help prevent boil off. In within the time frame of, you know, a couple weeks, it's feasible to have tanks even in low Earth orbit that would be stable enough to maintain cryogenic temperatures. Um, you couldn't stay out there for a year probably, um, but you would not necessarily need that. Um, so I think the um, 
the general concept will just be design the propellant depot to be able to hold that for an extended period of time, which is why you load that first and then you load the human landing system. Um, and the HLS obviously would only need that propellant for the few days that it's actually doing the mission. So there's differing requirements there. Um, let's see, another question. Do I recall right that the booster has to be one or two rings ring sections short as the high bay wasn't tall enough? Is that still the case? Well, they're building a new, high, or not built, building, have built the new mega bay or high bay two or whatever the heck it's called, um, which is slightly taller. Um, I don't know if we ever confirmed whether that was a problem like that. I don't know, but I know that the new one is taller, so um, I think they're good now. I just remember the uh, first booster that was stuck. They had to put a hole in the roof of the high bay and put the, the crone had to sort of like peek through the, right. hut the roof of the high bay to get to it. <laughs> so there's evidence in support of it. Um, I don't remember for sure, but um, I, the moral story is the new mega bay is as big as they need it for building yeah. boosters. Um, more questions. Here is one from Starbase Boca Chica, the real one, um, who asks, who has thoughts on when the first Polaris Dawn human spaceflight will occur? So, Pol yeah. well, first of all, should clarify, Polaris Dawn is only one mission. Polaris Dawn is the first mission in the Polaris program. So yes. minor naming convention there. But Polaris Dawn, still no earlier than the fourth quarter of this year, I believe. Um... Haven't heard. I mean, there's been a couple updates. I know the crew is in training now. Um, they've done like some scuba training and things like that. They've done some training out in Hawthorne as well, getting familiar with Crew Dragon because obviously only Jared Isaacman has actually flown before. Um, I don't know. Do we have any other thoughts on that, uh, Ed? I, I don't know, but I just know I got into a GIF war with um, Jared last night. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that was so good. <laughs> Red October the Red GIF October war. memes yeah. were so good. He won. <laughs> <laughs> I gave up when he came. He, he's the last one. I thought, oh, that's the winner. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Just shows he, he's a great guy. I mean, I, I said to John Krause, who's who's their official photographer, I said, he comes across just like, you know, I'd expect a commander to come across from the short experience. Yeah. He's got that leadership skill. And he's got that personality. You need that for these kind of missions. So I thought, if anybody's going to do this, this... This commercial, private, com uh, charity fundraising kind of all in one mission. He is the perfect guy for it. They've, it's just worked out wonderfully for them. Yeah, absolutely. And I would highly recommend that as a part of their Perlaris Dawn training, uh, Jared and the team fly uh, fly some more uh, jets around Starbase. <laughs> oh, <know>? oh, yes. <laughs> a few more times. I'm full, fully in support of that here as well. Always enjoy that. Um... So, yeah, good question there. Um, let's see. Do we know if Starships will need to wait for the usual transfer windows to Mars, or are they powerful enough to kind of go wherever they want? Um, Attila, thank you for the super chat question here. Um, well, I, it all I, depends I, on how much mass you want to get. Yeah, somewhere. exactly. You know, if if you if you don't care about how much payload you take, you can take a really inefficient trajectory, and uh, you know, take a wheel of cheese with you and that's it um, but if you want to get any useful mass uh, it is definitely opportune to wait for those more uh, opportune uh, orbit alignments now that being said with starship there's a lot of uh, a lot of power available and you know 100 tons to leo and and uh, after you refuel it uh, quite a bit to mars is a huge amount of capacity so maybe they only take half that much and they're able to you know have a little bit more flexibility with the uh, with the window there but it's going to be on a permission basis for sure Yep. Also, right. my thoughts on that is we're going to start, probably see a fleet of starships going for the for their best optimal window because I think if they want a city on Mars, mass will be the big thing. They'll mm -hmm. want to get as yep. much mass out there as possible on each starship. And I think we might see a wonderful, I mean, I'm envisioning it in my mind, a wonderful scenario where we see multiple starships leaving a roughly the same time Yeah. And for this optimal window with a lot of mass. And taking it all to Mars to be the initial building blocks for a city on Mars. That blows my mind as it starts. But I think that's what they'll probably go for, because I think mass will be the big consideration here. That's why they've gone for Starship. And I think also, I mean, just imagine you, you don't want to stage it too far in advance, because again, propellant boil off and things like that. But if you have the ability to stage these vehicles in low Earth orbit for, you know, a week or two before the window actually opens. Imagine you have 
a dozen ships waiting in orbit. You reach the window where they can do the transfer burn to Mars, and you just have a bunch of ships doing their trans-Mars injections within a day or two. That would be just super cool. The fleet staging in low Earth orbit and then leaving yeah. for Mars would be so cool. All right, some more questions. Um, will the final booster Starship get a white paint job? And if so, will the weld line still be visible? I don't think we're expecting any sort of paint job, right? Similar to uh, our favorite space vehicle here in this live stream, the space shuttle. I <laughs> cannot imagine SpaceX wanting to waste any extra mass with paint if they can avoid it. I'm only going to go back to the nose cone, the old HLS nose cone mock up. Yeah. They had it yeah. at the production site. They painted that white and put a NASA worm on it. I thought that's wonderful. And the US flag as well. I thought that yeah. was great. But yeah, you're right. It's not the sort of SpaceX thing to do to, to, to go down the AT, what, the external tank for STS 1, STS 2, and they painted it white for kind of cosmetic pe pe purposes only, I should say. It really was just for cosmetic purposes. They didn't need it. That's why every other external tank after that was just left unpainted with the orange firm. So, yeah, I, I'm with Nick on that one. I don't think they need to. And I think we've seen with what they were with the Ship 24, they can make it look pretty just by putting a little bit of paint on it with the, with the actual... Yeah, just the, like the decals. The and yeah, the decals. Yeah, exactly. I think that's all they need to do. I think I agree. Um, really quick, Distant Sun, thank you for becoming a Pad Rat member. And... Uh, Ferenc, I don't know if I spelled that right. Um, says, thank you for the Super Chat support. No message there. Also, Brad with some Super Chat support. Thank you all so much. Um, Dave Wolf uh, has a question. Has SpaceX put anything below the orbital launch mount other than Earth? What is below the McGregor tripod? So any sort of like protective material, I think, is the question to protect well, I was going to say, Earth is, Earth is definitely <laughs> below the orbital launch mount. Um, <laughs> Mars and Venus occasionally, I guess, but uh, that depends on where they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen anything, uh, no no flame diverter system or uh, really anything besides just a few uh, covers for the pedestals. They've added a few extra like uh, reinforcement covers for some of the uh, pedestal and they have uh, the water deluge system. Yeah. But other than that, it looks like at least initially they're just going to try it without it because at the end of the day, they're going to have to land these starships on Mars and uh, better to get more data sooner on the uh, on the ability of a raptor to be able to land or ignite fairly close to the ground and what it all kicks up and stuff. So, yeah, we'll see. I mean, we're going to get some insight into that with the static fire campaign, right? Yep. Yep. I'd say so. That'll be some I think it. That is a point worth making, I think, is that we're not only looking for vehicle readiness. Obviously, do the engines fire properly? Do the boosters, you know, boosters get to hold the cryogenic propellants? Obviously, they've gone through proof testing, so plenty of confidence there. Um, but just things like the GSC also supporting fueling operations nominally, the launch mount being able to withstand the engine firings, especially when they get to that 33 engine firing, if they do do a static fire with all 33. Um, and there's also just increasing the number of engines overall. I mean, we've seen six on a Starship on one of the suborbital stands. What When will we get above that on the orbital launch mount? So all of those things are things worth keeping an eye on for the Steadifier campaign. It's not just are the vehicles ready. All the supporting infrastructure needs to be ready as well. And that's a big part of why, you know, until pretty recently, we've been like, listen, you can say that the FAA is holding this up all you want. The fact is they haven't really proven that all the equipment's ready. And that's still not the case. We saw them earlier on this show working on the chopsticks, which need to be ready to stack the ship and or to support catch attempts. So there's still work being done, being done on all of these systems. And um, the static fire campaign will prove out more than just the engines, for example. Um, so that's a good question there. Um, Nerdly says, do you guys love space puns? Let them know in the comment section. Oh no 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 no! <laughs> you get the no. cow. You get the cow command. Oh no! <laughs> yeah. Uh, Brad has a question. What are the odds that Jared Isaacman is the first man on Mars? Hi. Hi. Yep. You think I, really? Yeah. No, I do higher, because higher the NASA. Than most. Sorry, you got Nick. Yeah, yeah. I'd say higher than most. Uh, he's he's at the forefront of the entire Starship program as far as uh, one of the big billionaires funding it and uh, one of the most adventurous guys out there. And I think, honestly, he's in the right age range and he's getting the needed experience with the uh, Inspiration4 mission and the Polaris, Dawn, uh, the Polaris missions. Uh, he's going to he's gonna be in a good position. We'll see, obviously. but I'm going to do a poll. <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> okay. 
By the way, the last poll, uh, I'll give the results, because uh, it was the launch tower during a fell catch. Structural damage at least, 52%. Nah, nothing too bad, 36%. Oh no, tower gone, 10%. <laughs> So that's that. I play. I can go along with that. that. That makes sense to me. The next poll will be: Is Jared the first man on Mars? Small fill for me I, while I type this out because I can't multitask. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I think I'll, I'll I'll give it a little bit of time and I'll I'll answer this near the end because I don't want to um, I don't want to influence the poll. Um, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> maybe chat doesn't listen to me. Maybe that wouldn't be a thing. But um, on that same topic, though, uh, John is asking, when is the next window for a Mars mission? That I can answer with you. Um, the next window literally opens this August. Um, mm -hmm. August 2022 is our next Mars transfer window. And there was a, another question in chat about, is anyone sending a mission to Mars in that window? There was going to be the Exo Mars mission, which was a <laughs> Russia and European um, collaboration. That's not happening due to current events. Um, I don't off the top of my head. I don't think anyone else is launching anything to Mars this window. Last no. window, there were like three different missions. Um, there's the Chinese one. There was the Emirati one that launched on a Japan Japanese rocket. So kind of two there, and then Mars 2020. Um, also Psyche was going to launch in the window because it was a Mars flyby on its way to its asteroid. That's not happening. Um, so I don't believe any missions taking advantage of the transfer window anymore. Um, the next one's 2024, isn't it? And then the next one's in 2024, yep. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to extend this question then. So those are the next windows. When do you think the first Starship uncrewed, crewed, any no payload, like anywhere from a bare bones prototype to a full up like cargo delivery to the surface to even a crewed mission, whatever it is, First starship to make a trans Mars injection. Let's put let's phrase it that way. What happens once it gets to Mars is irrelevant. First one to make a trans Mars injection. When do you think that is? I'm going to say not 2024. I think it's too soon. I think the focus is on the HLS contract with NASA for Mars for the Moon. Mm. Uh, when's the next one? 2026. Uh, I believe so. Hold on. I just had the If you don't, uh, if you ever want to look up transfer windows, the Cosmic Train Schedule is a very useful website. Um, let me pull up the list to make sure I'm not missing any because it's like not quite every two years. Um, yeah, so it's 2020. Oh, I take that back. There is a window in 2023, April of 2023. My apologies. Oh. Um, so then there's one in September of 2024, and then another one in June of 2025. Um, 26 27 there's no there's none in 2028 there you go um but uh yeah so you've got well, pretty solid um, opportunities there you see perhaps, elon or, sorry that goes sorry, you go sorry. First. i'm sorry uh <laughs> perhaps i'm uh the forever optimist here but i'm gonna say i i hope that there's one in 2023 uh we see a starship uh, do a trans mars injection burn wow now i think uh, that's very optimistic wow. i <laughs> I want to be optimistic here so I can be I can be proven wrong but it's it's fun to be optimistic. Uh I I think yeah SpaceX will definitely be worried about HLS and getting uh, back to the moon with uh with with NASA but I could also see Elon just saying, "Hey, we got we got this spare starship sitting around. You know, oh, we got we got this old booster. Let's let's just let's just see how this works." Yeah, no. <laughs> why not? What I was going to say was I can calibrate this a little bit by NASA's plan. The plan in 2015 for NASA's Mars campaign, had the first Mars vehicle, just basically just communications and things like that for, in preparation for the human landings in 2038. The first Block 2 triple mission in a year to send a crewed tra uh, Mars transfer vehicle to Mars was 2042. And that was in oh. 2015. So you Whoa. can see how far behind that is in NASA's planning. Now that Again, was before Starship was a glean in anyone's eye. So I think maybe we might see NASA and SpaceX align because it'd be expensive and it'd be it will need a motivational factor, which would be SpaceX Starship, where they align in a commercial way like the HLS program has with Starship and SLS and the whole NASA funding and SpaceX being a contractor and Elon's goal of trying to make life multiplanetary where we see Mars missions a lot sooner. Now, I think maybe SpaceX will prove out the technology in like the second half of the 2020s 
and then full up crew missions in the 2030s. That's what I think. I think that's realistic as well. I think Elon would do it sooner, but I think realistically, I think a combination of the two factors I just mentioned there would then allow for maybe a 10 year advance on NASA's current plans. Okay, so I need to backtrack really quick. When I said there was a Mars window in 2023, I haven't used this site in a while and I totally misread it. The 2022 window reaches Mars in 2023. There's there's no window that opens in 2023. That's my apologies, chat. I am sorry. I It sounded wrong in my head, but I knew sometimes there's weird dates things because it's not actually every two years. So no, there's windows in 2022, 2024, 2026, and then 2029. My apologies. I've so I guess that myself. makes me that makes me extra optimistic then. That makes you very optimistic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, but to round out that question about the Jared Eisenman part of it too, and I don't know, I don't know what what's the poll saying, Chris? I have a look. Right, the poll. Oh my word! Will Jared be the first person on Mars? Uh, nearly a thousand people have voted. Yes, forty four percent. No, fifty six percent. Wow. To be fair, that if, if I'd put my name to that and I got 44% thinking I'd be the first person on Mars, I'd be quite happy with that. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think you'll take that. I will put my fourth. My official answer was no, simply because <gasps> I cannot imagine the first crew on Mars not being at least majority, if not entirely, astronauts from NASA That's or fair, the yeah. ESA. I, I would be very surprised if the first crewed mission is private astronauts. I could see especially if it's on something like Starship, that there's a combination. Like, there could even be some SpaceX personnel that are not NASA astronauts alongside a NASA crew and maybe some ESA astronauts, some JAXA astronauts, things like that. That I could totally see. Um, and obviously, we're talking a little bit in the future at this point. But the first one to step out, I would be shocked if that's not a NASA astronaut. And also, you know Alex what? is making fun of me because I said ESA and not ESA. Listen, I'm not European. I don't know what the more pr- like common ESA. pronunciation is. It is ESA. I yeah. know it's ESA. My apologies. By the way, I want to ca- I want to I want to calibrate something about my answer. I was optimistic about Jared doing it just because I'm a big fan of what Jared does. Mm. He comes way he comes across, but he's got a family, and going yeah, to Mars is not the same as going on the the trips around low Earth orbit. You know, he's going to have to be committing to multiple years away from his family. That's a big ask. I think, yeah, you're right. I think if professional NASA astronauts and people committed to sort of like being away from Earth for a, a multiple amount of years. So, yeah, I may be going to edge my vote from yes to no. He might not want to do it. Right. There you go. Um, really quick, I want to thank the last bit of support that has come in here. Corporal Daywalker gives five red team memberships, a common name in chat. Thank you so much for that. Um, Sekiro with a pad rat membership. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. Uh, the chopstick should be called Elon's dream catcher. Change my mind. <laughs> okay. Uh, flawed perspective says that Elon will launch another roadster in 2023. Not sure about that. Maybe a cyber truck though. Um, yeah. but like I said, there's no 23 window. My fault. Again, chat. I embarrass myself. Someone take my aerospace engineering degree away. I clearly don't deserve it. Um, sun rising with another super chat as well. Thank you so much. Also, Antonio. Drunar and Justin, thank you all so much for your support. Uh, we really do appreciate everyone who supports the stream. Also, if you support via the YouTube membership program, I do want to thank at the end of every NSF Live, we want to give a big shout out to all of the YouTube members, um, especially the launch directors and flight engineers who have gone above and beyond with their very, very generous support of the channel. What we do is expensive and we cannot thank you all enough for helping make it happen. You are all the reason that we can have more camera views and continue to work to improve our coverage with new equipment and things like that. Um, so that we can continue sharing our excitement for spaceflight with you all. And so that we can uh, talk, hang out with you all and talk space all the time. We really appreciate it. Um, but I think that is going to wrap up this week's episode of NASA Spaceflight Live. Thank you all so much for joining us. Really quick, going around the horn, Chris Bergen, Managing Editor for NASA Spaceflight. Thank you for hopping on and talking space today. My pleasure. That went really fast. Really enjoyable. Awesome. Uh, Nick, as well, out there in the field, who is not only offering commentary, but his camera view. Nick, thank you so much for being out there today. Thanks for having me, everybody. Enjoy the weekend. Uh, what's left of it, I guess. It's Monday, huh? Bummer. 
Sad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a big thank you to also to Mary was out there. I know she was out there providing some of the camera views via the, the truck mounted camera as well. So thank you, Mary. Uh, my name is Thomas Burkhart, news director for NASA Space. I've been offering some commentary as well. And then Michael Baylor in the background, pushing buttons, pulling the levers. I feel like we all say the exact same thing, the exact same description of what Michael does, but that is what it is. Michael, thank you so much for everything you do as well. Um, Everyone in chat, thank you all so much for tuning in. Stay tuned for another live stream, hopefully later today. Vandenberg fog permitting, we should get a Starlink launch um, from Vandenberg. The first launch of the third shell of the Starlink constellation is scheduled for today. So thank you so much for tuning in, and we'll hope to see you on that stream. But until then, we will see you all next time. Later. Yikes. You bet. Okay. We don't need any more of these.